And today we're going to be doing another Anything Goes live question and answer session. So, Andrew has a whopper of a question for us to begin with. You're on, Andrew. Okay. How do you stop being an outsider at work? If How do you I... stop being an outsider at work? Yeah, if you're very shy and mm -hmm. not confident. Okay. That's a good question. If you're shy and not confident, I just did a webinar on communication skills for introverts. And I believe that it's kind of like Andrew's best friend for life, apart from himself, is my nephew, Eamon. And do you know how I taught Eamon how to swim? Uh, you threw him in the water. We threw him in the water. And the way that helped him swim is it gave him a little push. And when you have trouble communicating with other people, it kind of feels like you're on the high dive at the Fargo, North Dakota Island Park swimming pool. And when I used to go on the high dive, the first couple of times I think I went on it, I got on the top and I looked down and it was super scary. It seemed like it was really high. It was only like eight feet high. But I made the people behind me get down and I crawled down the high dive and did not go in. But I think it was Kenny Satrum who pushed me in anyway. And then I kept going over and over and over again. I'm, we're getting a red a something or other that I can't read. Uh, that's me. Okay. So... When you have a little push that, you know, like Uncle Dan pushing into the swimming pool, that little push helps you get started. And then as long as you have the water wings on, like Eamon did, you can keep going. And the water wings that you can use to continue conversations or actually to help you start a conversation when you're an introvert are going to be good lead-in lines. And the lead-in lines that I recommend for introverts are very simple. As long as you have these four, it will give you that little push, so it still seems a little scary, but you'll keep going. What do you think about? Tell me about. How do you feel about? And what happened next? If you have those four lead-in lines, what do you think about? How do you feel about? Tell me about. And what happened next? Is If you sit down in any environment, you know, with any stranger, and just remember, all I have are four lines. You know, I learned them on the way in. What do you think about? How do you feel about? Tell me about. And what happened next? You can talk to anybody, even Andrew. You know, like when I sit down next to Andrew, the average person, when they start a conversation or when they try to start a conversation, if they don't know any better, they're going to ask closed-ended questions. And closed-ended questions are going to be questions that by definition are going to get you most likely a one-word answer. People ask them by mistake. You know, they mean to be asking a, a, an open-ended question. Open-ended question, remember, an and open-ended question opens the lines of communication. Closed-ended questions close the lines of communication. And when you mean to open the lines but ask a closed-ended question, it sounds like, so Andrew, what do you do here? I am a community manager at Dan O'Connor Training. A lot of words for a closed-ended question. Do you like that? Yeah. How long have you been doing it? S six months, give or take. Are you making good money? No. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's how an average person does it, because they don't know any better. If you were to instead use the lead-in lines, it would sound more like, so, Andrew, tell me about what you do here. Well, I'm a... Ah! That first word that he said, well, that's what most people say when you ask a question that's actually an open-ended question. When you say things like, so Andrew, tell me about where you're from. I'm from Mexico. I'm from Guadalajara. Oh, that's interesting. Tell me about that. Well, Guadalajara is the place where tequila is made. It's a very nice region. It's one of the three largest cities in Mexico. And yeah, I really much like it. It has, it's very multi -cur cultural and all of that. Oh, how old were you when you moved here? I was 10. Oh, tell me about that time in your life. I was studying primary school. <laughs> what happened next? See, when you start a question with, tell me about, how do you feel about, what do you think about, you know, so what do you think about working here? So how do you feel about the new manager that we have? People will inevitably stop and say, well, and then they'll start talking because even though those are very simple lines, 
Most people do not use them. Most people, like really, when was the last time somebody asked you to tell them about anything? It doesn't happen often. So when somebody says to you, you know, where are you from, as opposed to tell me about where you're from, very different. So remember that if you are a introvert and you want to start a conversation with anybody, just use those lines. Tell me about, how do you feel about, what do you think about, and what happened next. As long as you do that, you are golden. You can sit there and you, if you watch, for example, reruns, because I think she's only available now in reruns, of Oprah Winfrey, are those, are those even available at all? Do you ever watch that? Uh, I haven't watched chocolate. Like he watches it every day. He's just in front of the sofa with a big gallon of ice cream and just puts the chocolate sauce right in it and gobble, gobble, gobble. When he does that, if you watch the episodes of Oprah Winfrey, who was at the time the highest paid communicator on television, or if you watch, you ever watch Larry King? Yes, I did. He doesn't even know who he is. And if you watch those, all those people do is start their lines or the start the conversations with, so... Tell me about da 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 da, and as the people will talk, they'll say, "Interesting. Tell me more about that." Or go on. What happened next? And they seem as though they are fascinating. They are the most were the most highly paid communicators on television. I would find some highly paid communicators of the day, but I don't have television anymore, so I don't know who they are. Uh, but I will guarantee you, whoever they may be. All they're going to do is ask people to tell them about things. They'll ask people how they feel about things, and all. J all that, <laughs> just doing that, excuse me today, I'm a little bit in a uh, antihistamine fog. If you just do that, you will seem fascinating and people will love to talk to you. So there you go, that's how you do it. Okay, we must remind the, remind the audience that we have a new oh, form of getting questions. Yes, you're going to love this. If you have a question and we can't get to it, even if, well, you won't know if we'll be able to get to it or not, but when you have a question, please leave your question and your Twitter handle. So hashtag whatever it is, so that if I cannot get to it during this live event, what I will do is make a response to it and then we will upload it to Twitter? Yes. So we will tweet back to you. What do you think about that, DT? Okay, go ahead. Okay, so rem remember to put your Twitter account. On Twitter account, questions. questions. Okay, uh, Jupiter is... Hey, Jupiter! Okay. Oh, we love Jupiter. <laughs> yes. So, Desire Styles has a question. He says, yes. will this be uploaded later or have later sessions? Well, it's being uploaded live. Yeah. So, again, if you... We will have later sessions. If you wanted to guarantee that your question is answered, you know, uh, more quickly than the others, again, hashtag... And we, if you have a Twitter, I'm, a, I'm thinking we, I didn't even know I had a Twitter, but I guess I do. And we will answer them. But I don't understand that. So let me get the question along with you. Okay. When we answer these on Twitter, or when we, when we tweet back to people, okay. are we going to be tweeting those live? Do we do it? Periscope. We, yeah, I think we are, right? Yeah. Yeah, no wait, we're but they won't know. We'll make a short video and oh. we're going to tag them on the video. We'll so make a short t video and tag them on the video. I'm repeating everything he says because I'm crazy. Okay, so GM has yes. a question. He says, what is the best way to meet people at a conference during the Continental Breakfast? Well, I have to tell you, that's a good question. The Continental Breakfast part of the conference. We were just talking about that. When I go to a conference, I am not a social person. And as you can tell, I just get up from a nap. I'm not a morning person. It takes, my, it takes me a while for my brain to wake up and my, my mouth to kind of connect with my brain. And when I go to conferences or things like that, I have to go to the breakfasts because I'm either you know, paid to be there or I have to make the most of the, the event that I paid to go to. And since I normally don't like to sit down next to strangers and just start up a conversation, I will have to have my lead-in lines ready. So again, it comes back to the lead-in lines. You know, you just sit down and you make yourself, you give yourself a little push into the deep end of the pool and you sit down and introduce yourself to people. Okay, that was another thing we just did on our live, uh, or on our, what, did, what do you call it, Andrew? A uh, Live webinar? No. The, the live webinar, yes. On socialization for introverts. When you introduce yourself to people, just doing that, you can really impress people and get them to open up or the opposite. You'll shut them down and get them to close down. But the right way to introduce yourself to someone, and it forces you to, you know, get into sync with the, with the world, you know, to commune. There are specific steps in introducing yourself. And it is, 
Make sure that your shoulders are back, chest is out. And that not only puts you in, oh, that does feel good. That not only puts you in a physical position that opens you up physically to communication, but in a cosmic sense, it starts to connect you with the environment around you when your shoulders go back and your chest is up. And you lean into people, make direct eye contact, extend your hand, and you say, hi, I'm so-and-so, what's your name? And that seems really simple. Again, you say, hi, whoops, <laughs> we got to enter a new computer. Hi, I'm Dan, what's your name? Andrew. Hi, Andrew, nice to meet you. So tell me, what do you think of the conference so far? Well, I think it's been very interesting. What the keynote speaker had to say was, well, I can relate to that. Wow, that is fascinating since we haven't even started a conference and we're living in fantasy land. When you do that, when you put your shoulders back, chest up, lean forward and say, hi, I'm so-and-so, what's your name? That, again, seems very simple. It is not simple to do, but it can be very easy if you practice it, practice it, practice it, practice it. And there's a reason you want to do it just like that. If you were to say to somebody instead of, hi, some people do this. Hi, what's your name? Andrew. Andrew, that's rude. <laughs> you know, like, it's like, you know, Andrew goes to a lot of online dating sites. A lot. And when Andrew goes to some of these sites, he's been kicked off so many times for, you know, doing illicit things or, you know, vulgar things mm -hmm. that he can no longer post his, po his photo. And so he'll start chatting with people and say, you know, hey there, what's your name? And they'll be like, block, block, because he has no photo attached to it. And people don't like it when you come up to them and ask them questions without having first revealed the answer to them. So you want to make sure to say, hi, I'm so-and-so. What's your name? Or, well, I'm in the so-and-so department. Tell me about what you do. So anytime you introduce yourself or ask a stranger a question, first give them your answer because that, according to communication protocol, remember that protocol has been designed and is used to help other people feel comfortable. That's what it's all about, which is why it is the pet peeve of Andrew's and mine when other people use things like manners or protocol against somebody to make them feel bad. That is a perversion of what they were, you know, there's enough of that going around. That is a perversion of what they were actually designed for, which is to make people feel comfortable. So the correct protocol when introducing yourself to somebody is to, is to say first what your name is. Hi, I'm Dan, what's your name? Secondly, the reason you want to do it just like that is because if I were to have said, hi, my name's Dan, what's your name? I'm letting you know by that introduction, hi, my name is, that I'm not confident. And if I'm not confident, there's, I'm going to sabotage the possibility of your possibly being confident. And the reason we reveal that we're not confident when we say, my name is, is because if I were to say to Andrew, hi, my name's Dan, what's your name? It's so meek and it's so timid it's unnatural for me to be introducing myself to you if I am by nature that meek and timid. And when we tell somebody what our name is, that's you know giving them a, a, a fact about what somebody put on a birth certificate. When instead, <laughs> when instead, people who, are we still recording? <laughs> people who yes. feel as though they have self-actualized, they have become more than what they are, they were you know named as a baby. They say that you know they say hi I'm so and so. You know could you imagine? Andrew, who's a big star these days that would be very confident? Confident. Uh, and feel like they're the, the Shiats. Um, uh, mm, Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart? Yeah. Where did you pull that out? Who's Kevin Hart? A stand-up comedian. Where? Well, okay, Christian Bale. <laughs> Christian Bale. Super, he's, uh, Batman? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Could you imagine Batman saying to somebody... Hi, my name's Batman. Or, hi, my name's Christian Bale. They don't sound, that just doesn't sound right because they would say, I'm Christian Bale or, I'm Batman. And they say that because that I'm is much more than simply what is in their name. You know what I mean? So, especially in a professional environment, when you're at that continental breakfast, just use that simple structure. Hi, I'm so and so, what's your name? Oh, tell me about that. You know, very simple. And if you can do that, just keep using those phrases over and over, over and over and over again and sit at a table with lots of people at it. And by the way, when you are having a conversation at one of these tables that you're, you know, just doing your best to kind of stay in the stream of conversation, or if you're new at work, like our question at the beginning, you might find yourself in a situation where you might have even started the group conversation, but now you really don't know how to get back into it because people are talking over you and around you. And 
you know, for some of us, like, you know, at this moment in time, my, my brain is still waking up. And it's difficult for us to jump in there when people are alert, awake, throwing out ideas, engaging one another. So remember to piggyback, but piggyback the right way. When you piggyback off of somebody else's idea, you know, if there's a lull in the conversation and nobody said anything, contribute whether you agree or disagree with somebody's idea, but do it this way. If you're going to disagree with somebody, you know, simply say to somebody, well, you know what, in regard, or, or not in regards to, that's a danger phrase, regarding what John said, I'd like to say that I think that's a great idea. And I, I agree that that's a, that's a, that's, that's a good idea. Oh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm disagreeing. Oh, I don't think that's a good idea. Let's say that that was what I said. You know, I don't think that's a good idea. I disagree with that. First of all, instead of using the word disagree, remember to use the phrase that savvy communicators use, which is going to be referring to the way they see things. You know, well, I'd like to jump on what John said. And, you know, I have to tell you, John, I see things a little bit differently. The reason is that idea doesn't seem too customer focused to me. And let me tell you why. I believe that if we do X, Y, Z, as you stated, we might be leaving our customers out of the loop and therefore lose some of them to Jan, who had a very customer focused idea. Instead of saying good, bad or indifferent, you know, whatever, tell you, tell the people within the conversation why something is good or bad. Meaning instead of saying, I'd like to support that idea. I think it's a good one. Why is it good? Is it do you think maybe more cost effective? If so, state that. But instead of saying, I, I disagree with something, talk about how you see it. I see it another way. I see it differently. I take a different view. And when you are agreeing with something, remember to say why or disagreeing to say why. Because there's a big difference, as you will see. You know, I'm saying, listen, there's a lull, but I want to participate. And Andrew had a good idea. He thinks that we should change our accounting system to a, a card system so that our customers, instead of going to the grocery store with little stamp books, they could use the, the card. I could say, you know, before we leave here today, I would like to tell Andrew how much I support his idea and why. I think that is an extremely cost-effective solution for a complex problem. And it's a customer-focused one that will give the customers while they're at the checkout counter more time to talk with us and for us to talk with them and find out what their concerns are or what they've really enjoyed using. So way to go, Andrew. I fully support you in that extremely cost-effective and customer-focused idea. Now, the reason I, I, of course, probably wouldn't go into that much uh, long detail, but if I were to simply say, yeah, you know, I really like that idea about the cards instead of the, the paper vouchers at the register. That's a great idea. You know, I've seen that work with other establishments and I think it would work with ours as well. If I were to simply say that, what was missing was his name and he's going to know that. You know, when people piggyback off our ideas and do not give us credit for it, that's when we start to get into trouble. But if you're the piggybacker and you always make sure when you're going to piggyback to single somebody out and say, yeah, I'd like to support Andrew and his idea. Andrew, that's it, blah, blah, blah. And then you piggyback off of them. People hear that right away because it's their own name and they're going to think the whole time, thank you. Yes, they called me out by name. I couldn't miss it because it's my name and it's the sweetest sound to my ears. Thanks. I appreciate your support, especially the way you detailed why it's such a good idea. Thank you, Dan. You can piggyback off me anytime. If I had not used his name, he might have missed that because most in most conversations, the person who speaks on an idea, the last, the, the last person to address an idea, speak on an idea, introduce an idea, is the one who tends to own that idea. And you can feel that if you're the one with the idea and then somebody else piggybacked off of it and now it's their idea, it can be a little off-putting. If, however, I use his name, the other people will still connect me more with the idea than him. But he'll be happy as a loon because I use his name talked about why it was so great. So he likes me. Everyone else heard me contribute to the conversation in a meaningful way. Instead of just saying I did or did not like it, I said why. And I have participated in the conversation. So it's a win-win all around. Andrew, what's the next question? Okay, we have a tip. Tip. Oh, yay, yay. From Dream Queen. Hey, Dream Queen. $10. Hey, thanks, Dream Queen. That is a lot here. I appreciate that. Uh, when I say here, Andrew and I today are nestled in the bosom of the Sierra Madre here in the heart of Mexico. And 
you can get, what could you get for uh, 200 pesos? Oh. <laughs> see, it's a lot. Yeah. We could go to the movies yeah. and see, has anybody seen the new, uh, the new Judy Garland movie? Andrew wants to see it. He's all into that type of stuff. Who's Judy Garland? I'm gonna, and cats, cats, cats is oh. all, I heard that was a real stinkeroo. Okay, you ready for the next question? <laughs> Thank you, Dream Queen. Devon says, can you make some suggestions of how to communicate with people who consistently under, undermine, undermine, invalidate, and dismiss you? Well, okay, how can, yes, I, I have a tip for that. How can you communicate more effectively with someone who undermines what you say, invalidates what you say, or is dismissive? Is that it? Yes. Okay. I, the only hesitation I have is if this might be at work or at home. Um, and are there other people there? Under normal circumstances, what I recommend doing is this. If somebody is going to try to undermine what you say, for example, uh, all right, everybody, quick announcement before we all get back to work. Before you leave your stations today, remember to take all of your tools and put them in the designated area underneath your desk before you go to eat or it would create a safety hazard. And you know, here we're all about safety, safety first. And then Andrew says, ah, that's not how John said to do it. When that type of thing happens, in a, especially in a professional environment with other people, remember that that may be but, and then broken record. And what that does is, it lets the people know, you can say whatever you want. You can try to undermine my authority. You can try to dismiss my ideas. They are valid. They were valid. I'm not even going to pause to think of a response to you because what I said a moment ago still stands, is valid, and it sounds like this. So, Andrew, do that for me, okay? So, before you leave your workstation today, Andrew, remember to take all of your equipment and place it in its correct area before you go to eat or it creates a safety hazard for everybody else, okay? Yes. No, Andrew! <laughs> you have to say... You have to say, that's not how John told us to do it. Okay. No. okay gotcha. Andrew, when we go to lunch today, remember to take your equipment and put it in its designated area. Because if you don't, that creates a safety hazard for everybody else. Okay? Well, John told us to do it differently. Well, that may be. But before you go to lunch today, again, make sure to take your equipment and store it in its designated area. Or again, it creates a safety hazard. Capiche? But I think John doesn't want it that way. Well, that may be, but today what we're going to do is put your equipment in its designated area before we go to lunch, or again, you'll have a safety and other type of hazards. Okay. Okay. So when you do that, you know, you say, well, that may be, but blah, 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 blah. When it becomes contentious, you know, really contentious, is when, <laughs> you know, when, excuse me, when that, when people push it so much that you have found yourself repeating yourself three times, four times. You know, my nephew, Eamon, or even, you know, sometimes Andrew, might be like, <laughs> because you're just repeating yourself over and over again. That's okay. I'm not doing it for you. You know, I'm doing that for me because I'm letting you know and anyone else who may be listening, oh, that little extra wind that you heard over there, we're just going to dismiss that the way we would any other wind and say, well, that may be, but, and then you repeat yourself. And when you do that, it's amazing how much more powerful your messages will be, especially if people know they can't really wear you down. I mean, when I start to do other things, you know, if I were to, for example, explain myself, you don't know, say, well, you know, John didn't know about the safety hazards of today and how things have changed and yada, yada. That just opens it up to another argument. Uh, but just remember, that may be, but... And then repeat yourself. You know, uh, I was just dealing with a woman whose house was for sale. And she knew that the realtor, when he came back for their second meeting, was going to try and push her into uh, putting her house in the market for a lot less than it was worth. And she wanted a price. I can't. I, I think it was like she wanted to get 310 That's what she wanted to list it at. And so she said, I'm really nervous. What do I do? So I gave her that exact strategy. Use the that maybe but. Then repeat yourself takes the stress off of you, and it helps you stand your ground in a very confident, straightforward, uh, assertive way. And so she came back, she said, I can't believe how easy and effective it was. So she said to him, some, you know, he said something like, well, you know, now is the B10. Well, I, I have to just say, I strongly oppose that. Well, that may be, but we're listing it at 310. And it was amazing how, guess what it listed at? 
310. And she said, I didn't worry about it. You know, I wasn't struggling with the words. I didn't have to, you know, get angry or upset or become a different communicator from the communicator that I would that I went in there wanting to be. So fantastic strategy. <laughs> fantastic strategy. That may be but and repeat yourself. Easy breezy. Okay. So just to say. Um Mup Muppet 929. Hi Muppet 929. How to correct people without sounding like uh in person? Oh, okay. It feels like when I have to correct someone, I either come off harsh or rude or the other extreme where I sound like I'm unsure of what I'm saying. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, how to correct just how to correct someone else when and not sound like you're being demeaning or like you're uh uh like you're unsure of yourself. Wait, 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 wait. I think we're out of internet. Uh, internet's out? Well somebody say well I can't get on it. And somebody said no more sound or image for me in London. No more sound or image in London. Do we have images or sound other places? I don't have internet here. Oh well, that's 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 a shame. Well, I'm going to assume that we still have internet. Okay, if we do, then you'll get this. If not, hashtag Twitter it when you won't know that I'm saying that. Uh, what does it look like? Well, I'm trying to see. Okay, we're going to take a a. Could you go with your mobile data? I think so. Okay. I think my oh, look 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 look. It's working. Great. It's working. No. no it sounds correct. Yeah. It's fine in Chicago. Okay. Okay. It's working. Okay. I apologize for the London problems. It, it, maybe it's something to do with Brexit. <laughs> Ask Teresa May. <laughs> when we, um, when you have to correct somebody, the way to do it is to, it's, <laughs> if you're at work, or you're at home, it might be a little different, you know, but basically it's going to be like this. My mother used to be a nun. Uh, they kicked her out of the convent be, while she was, you know, she, she was a novice, I believe, you know, something like that. She, she didn't have the full habit, you know, she was like a, a half a habit. And before she got into the full regalia, they said, you are way too rambunctious and possibly a lesbian, so we're kicking you out. And so in her nun training, she definitely learned the way to correct people. Because the nuns were all about, it's not about how you feel about me correcting you. It's not about how I feel about correcting you. It's about correcting you and getting it done so that we can get the work of the day done. If that really is your mindset, the correction comes out more clearly with authority. And, and it, it, it's actually not as harsh. When, it, when you know it's not about the person, it is about the way they're doing things. It's about the correction that you need to make. And it sounds like this. You know, if, if I'm at home and I, I were saying something like, uh, okay, <laughs> if I were to say, hmm, well, you know, I just don't think it's fair because irregardless of how I feel, the, the, and my mother would say, regardless, and she would just make that correction, regardless, or you mean regardless, and then I would keep on talking now, regardless. Yeah, I think that people should, damn, regardless. Okay, regardless of how people feel, I believe. And so she would stop and make me go back, say it, and then keep going. But it was not about my behavior. It was about that word that I was mispronouncing. So she would just say it. You know, it wasn't like, for example, some people might say, Ex you know, excuse me, that's a pet peeve of mine. It's regardless. And she wouldn't be timid about it and say, um, I, I think you mean, you know, or uh, I, I'd suggest. So look, when you correct somebody, who put this, what's the name of the person? Muppet. Nine. Muppet, yes. I've seen you before. When, when you're correcting somebody, watch how you do it. You know, pay attention how you naturally do it. If you have a tendency to add words like I'd suggest or, you know, have you considered, eliminate those. You know, if you're correcting them with a suggestion, say, I suggest yada yada. But when you give the correction, give it swiftly, quickly. Not uh, what I recommend in terms of body language is lean in and as you say it, give a quick head nod. You know, for example, uh, let's say that I'm power washing the bricks behind my mother's house. Just theoretically. 
And instead of putting the connector on the hose, it didn't seem to fit the right way at the beginning. So I cut the hose off and stu stuffed it in the hole and made it work because, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a problem solver, you know, and so I just thought I'd stuff it in. Instead of going back and saying, what is wrong with you? Why would you think that? No, by the way, those types of phrases, why would you think? How could you think? Did you think that? You know, we want to eliminate all of those. So I'm going to say the two examples I'm going to give now are, let's say, uh, you know, my mum, because this is from England, and Jim. Mum might come up now because she's forgotten her nunnish ways and say something like, What's wrong with you? Why did you think that that was the way to do it? Would you turn that off and get, go ask Jim how to do that? Okay, that's one way. Or you could use the Jim approach and come up and go, we have a connector for that. And then he keeps, he keeps going. For him, it's all about the connector. There you go. I'm not making it personal. I'm telling you what to do and I'm moving right along. You can tell there was nothing personal involved in that. If he were more timid and was like, oh, oh, Dan, y yeah, you know, I, 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 might, I should have told you that, you know, we have connectors for that hose. Y you don't need to cut it. I'd suggest in the future, you know, just asking me if you don't know how to connect those two hoses and I can help you do it in a way that won't end up costing us a lot of money and time in the long run. Too much. You know what I mean? So just lean into the person, nod forward, give the correction and stop right there. That tends to make it not so personal. And people, even if it stings a little bit, you have to let it sting. You know, if it hurts a little bit when you give somebody a correction, they will thank you because you are doing the right thing and it's helping them. And at the end of the day, they'll come back and say, mom, I got a hundred on my spelling test and I think I'm going to get a hundred on the next one, whether or not you help me. Is that whether with an H or without an H? It would be a, a whether without an H. That'd, that'd be a with, that's a with, with, whether, whether, until they cry. You know, you could try it that way too. Go ahead, Andrew. Okay. Next question is, tell me how to eliminate ums, ahs, and crunch words. You speak great. Oh, thank you. That's from everyone read this. That's, that's from everyone read this? Yeah, that, that's the name. Wow. The great. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I have found when I first started speaking, I had to record what I spoke, or when I spoke, I'm gonna show you. Um, I happen to have it, because I'm always ready for an invasion. I'm gonna prove that I do this. <laughs> this is my handy webcam. Uh, and I use that still because when you, the most by far effective way to eliminate you called them crunch words. At the time, we called them seal words. And the reason they called them, we, the reason we called them seal words is because seals would go, um, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, and that's why they called them seal words, I guess. <laughs> but the seal words are going to be things like, um, ah. Uh. The reason people use them under normal circumstances and then make it a habit is because they're almost like verbal placeholders. When it's my turn to speak, if I feel as though I might lose my turn if I don't fill the air with some sound, we tend to say things like, um, um, well, you know, when, um, I, um, and we start to do it so much, it becomes a habit so that instead of a little empty space, we fill that with an, um, um, uh, then it's entrenched into our style. The best way to kick a bad habit when it comes to your speaking style is going to be to record yourself and watch it. The reason I, <laughs> the reason I say it that way, you know, like you have to do it is because we all have the ability to do that these days. It's very simple to take a phone, record yourself speaking, and then watch it back when you're alone. It's very simple, but it's such torture that most of us don't do it because when you watch yourself, it's just like in the old days when we used to hear ourselves on answering. Andrew, imagine this. Mm -hmm. See, I'm from the days before the internet and before internet, when I moved to Mexico, there was no internet. And back in those days, we would leave each other voicemail messages. I don't know if you, I, I don't ever check them, but do people still use voicemail messages? Yes. Okay. When people would listen to their answering machine or their voicemail messages, inevitably, Everybody would always say the same thing. That doesn't sound like me, right? You know what I'm talking about? If you're from that generation, we'd always say, That's a, now do you, when you hear messages from yourself, do you say that doesn't sound like me? 
Well, most people say I sound like my mom. You have such a good mom. Does she have a deep voice? No, but when I left voice messages, they say I sound like my mom. Oh, that's because it's of, your, of your soft feminine side. <laughs> when you nothing wrong with that. When you um, <laughs> back from my day, it is interesting how when you listen to your own voice. It's, it's different from the way you hear it in your head because of the acoustics going on in your head. And so everybody would always say, that doesn't sound like me, does it? Does it? And then when you learned, yeah, that sounds just like you, it would be torture. That realization would be like, oh no, that's what I sound like? Yep, it is. But I, I just, I asked the question because I think in this digital age, in this age that we're in, I think we grow up used to the sound of ourselves and we grow up used to watching video of ourselves. I would assume, I would assume. Yes? Yeah. 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 So, it's very difficult to do it if the, if the expressed sole purpose is to correct yourself. You know, if, you're, if I'm watching a video of myself on the phone, for example, that's going to be tough to do because what I'm doing is looking for errors, looking for things to correct, and it just makes you squirm when you do it. But it's the most effective because when you have to watch a video of yourself and you watch yourself deliver those, what did you call them, um, uh, crunch words or seal words, because it's so difficult to watch, it increases the odds dramatically that you will start cutting them the next time you speak because you know, I'm going to have to watch this and it's going to be torture every time I say, um, ah, uh, ooh, e. So I'm going to consciously start to eliminate that from my verbal repertoire. And you will notice as you do that, that in doing so, you might have those spaces. Like right now when I'm speaking, you know, I could say you might have those, um, you know, those, those, those spaces in the air where you don't, um, uh, um, you, you, you're remembering your words, but you know, to fill the, 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 the space, you, um, um, you use those words. If I were to instead say, when you're remembering words, to fill the space with silence actually makes what you have to say much more powerful and people are more willing to wait for it than those who simply fill it with seal words. So you'll start to eliminate those words and you'll realize how much more impactful your message will be. Yep. Okay. Yes. So I think that... Okay, that, that is it. But that just... that There's somebody knocking on the door. Um, that reminds me. I wanted to say in our... In one of these upcoming sessions, I like to amuse myself. And so <laughs> I like to watch... I love pageants. You know, beauty pageants? For different reasons than you may think. The number one reason is, yes, I like to watch people fall, and it, it somehow gives me such, it's, it's a horrible, I, it's horrible, Andrew, but it's, you know, it's, it's what happens. Everybody and, that that's okay, we're just live. Eh? That's Jorge. Hi, Jorge. Hi, Jorge. Uh, are you live? Yes, we're live. Oh, okay. Yes, <laughs> that's Sorry. okay. That's okay. Oh, that is Jorge loves beauty pageants, right, Jorge? Who is your favorite beauty pageant queen? Quién es tu reina de belleza favorita? Um, Heidi Klum. Heidi Klum. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, when you watch Heidi Klum, where people like bye. <laughs> that's okay. When you watch them, this this is just, this is just kind of an exercise. When you watch them give little, let's say they're interview answers during a pageant. It's funny because many people have asked me for a pattern. You know, how can I take a message and make it sound more like those beauty pageants queens or like that news director person? People have scripts in terms of the tone, cadence, speed with which they speak. And I was watching beauty pageant reviews, watching the different ways that people have decided to kind of the, the frames that they use for their messages. And Ivanka Trump, I have to tell you, she used to co-host the Miss Universe pageant. And I'm totally not getting political at all. I just thought it was hysterical how consistent her pageant answer was in terms of the, the, the frame that she used. And a lot of people can use it because no matter what she said, by the time she got done speaking, it was as if, you know, you took a story and then it was a little difficult, but at the end, you found your answer. Yeah, that was it. What? And what? 
watch anything she says. Because then I saw her. Then I saw her being interviewed at some Women's Day. Uh, she was the guest host for some women's conference uh, in Mumbai or something like that, where the women were, you know, business women giving micro lending opening micro lending businesses or something. And so they asked Ivanka Trump, you know, tell me you you're now a, you know, part of the administration of the, you know, greatest country on earth. You know, you worked hard for that position. So, uh, tell me what you think about it and what you've learned so far. <clears throat> well, it's been a long journey since I've started there and you know, we had some things to get over. But, you know, working together, yeah. We've gotten over them and I think we've made a lot of progress. <gasps> and everybody, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, oh my God, is she going to do it again? Everything she was asked, she said, well, you know, I'm going to just use this tone. And then, oh, I get to the middle of my saying and I start to see clarity. And then at the end, I nod my head forward and say, and here we are now. And everybody goes, oh, yay. Oh, that's nice. Like she actually had a beginning, a middle and an end. Her beginning sounds like this. And then... The middle starts to do that, and she looks into the corners of Never Never Land, and the end sounds like this. Yes, it does. No matter what she was saying, it was so hysterical. But I, I have to give credit where credit is due. As I was watching it, I thought, oh my gosh, that's such a good pageant uh, uh, frame with which to deliver a message. So, for fun, if you are struggling with things like seal words, like making conversation, like making... Anything you say, yeah, sound more interesting. So when you do that, when, when you're doing that, look at the people whose job it is to communicate, it, to communicate an interesting message. Look at the people whose job it is to respond impromptu to scripted questions and watch the, the, the manners that they use to do it and then incorporate those that you believe would match your style into your into your you know, communication, and you'll be amazed at how varying tone, cadence, words, you know, using the same pattern to deliver what you say helps give it an extra boost. And I hope, by the way, that, that when I was talking about recording, that was the whole message. When you record yourself and you watch it, you will start to eliminate the words that you are using too often because you'll think to yourself as you speak, when I'm watching this, I'm going to have to be the judge and you are by far going to be your most harsh critic, except for my, my mother, you know, if she's your critic, she might be a little harsher than you would be. But in the end, it pays off. <laughs> you know, so mom, I'd like to thank my mother for helping me learn the difference between weather, weather, and weather. You know, practice makes progress. Anything else, Andrew? Uh, I think that's it for today. Well, you know, as I mentioned, I think at the beginning, it takes me 20 minutes for my brain to fully awake and connect with my mouth. And so thank you for hanging in with me as I went through that process. I think I'm connected, but now it's time to go. So for everybody here at Danaconda Training, remember, hashtag your question. And we, or hash, what, what do you call it? Oh, we put your Twitter account. Put your Twitter account on there. And uh, we will answer your questions in a uh, Twitter periscope, as, as a pair of Twitter. And we will do that by when, Andrew? Tomorrow? Or Tomorrow we gonna... during the week. To... Well, to... throughout the week. <laughs> Tomorrow we start with the first one. Tomorrow we'll start. So thank you everybody for your questions. I appreciate them. It helps me, uh, you know, get back into the swing of things from our, uh, we were, we'll call it a, uh, what were we on? We were on a, a sabbatical. I'll, I'll, I'm going to go with the, with the con, con, convent theme that I've been stuck in today. So we were, as, if that is by, if that is in fact a, a convent theme, I don't know. So Andrew, it's been a pleasure. Okay. For everyone else here at Dan O'Connor Training, this is Dan O'Connor. Bye. Setting off. I still don't know how to stop this. <laughs> okay, let me help you. Just a sec. Just a sec. We have some beside behind the scenes coming. Yes. So, right where it says the red button stop, you click that.